In, in 1893, the economy of the United States was in a depression. The railway bubble had burst. And the rail magnets had overestimated the amount of railways needed. And their shaky financing <coughs> caused some bank failures. There was a run on gold. And there was a severe drought in the Midwest that parched all the farmlands, forcing the farmers to go bankrupt. And then the financial panic spread from the United States <coughs> across the Atlantic to Europe. And they sold off all of their American stocks, sending the markets into a downward spiral. At that time, George Pullman, the inventor of the sleeper car, ran one of the larger rail companies. And he had also built and ran a town for his workers. One worker said this, we are born in a Pullman house, fed from Pullman shops, taught in the Pullman school, catechized in the Pullman church, and when we die, we shall go to Pullman hell. <laughs> In May 1894, when Pullman cut jobs, reduced wages, and increased the working day to 16 hours to maintain <coughs> his profits, at the same time, he did not lower the rents or the utility bills on his workers' homes. The people reacted with a wildcat strike. The American Railway Union an organization that included over 250,000 workers across 27 states, supported the strikers, and the conflict began to increase across the whole country until President Grover <coughs> Cleveland called in the U.S. Marshals and 12,000 U.S. Army troops. 13 workers were killed and 57 were wounded. And the rail workers did over $340,000 in property damage before the conflict was finally brought to a close. Six days after the strike, President Cleveland pushed through legislation through the Congress to make Labor Day a national holiday. <coughs> This conflict was solved with force and then appeased with a holiday. Today, we find our nation again in a downward economic turn. Unemployment hovers around 9%. Standards and Poor has downgraded the U.S. as a borrower, sending shockwaves of fear across the sea into Europe, and they're selling American stocks. The markets have gone nuts. Workers in some states have staged protests. Does this sound familiar to you? Alan Sloan, a financial analyst, claims that the root of our current problems is that there are no grown-ups in positions of serious power in Washington. He accuses our leaders of shrinking at each other rather than listening and using rational methods to solve our problems. Will our politicians be able to solve their conflicts for the health of the nation? I certainly hope so. I'm very prayerful over that. Jesus recognized that conflict was inevitable among humans especially in counter-cultural communities like that that followed Jesus. He also know, knew that the way a community solves their problems is critical to its survival. So in today's reading in Matthew, we learn about Jesus' method of conflict resolution. Jesus begins at a personal, individual level. When two people have a conflict, when they've missed the mark, where a brother or sister has sinned against you, he suggests these two people work it out in private. Well, that's in line with our modern day theories. 
One, one method is called the pinch theory. And it suggests as soon as you're offended by someone, as soon as you're pinched, you let that person know in a private conversation. And that way, the tension doesn't build up to an insurmountable level. This week, in the Baltimore Sun and the Funny Pages, there was a cartoon called Pearls Before Swine. And in the first, in the very first frame of that cartoon, Rat has his hands clenched and his face all scrunched up. And Goat says to him, what are you doing? And Rat says, I'm holding a grudge. Pig has really ticked me off, and I'm getting back at him. In the second frame, Pig, smiling, dancing past the window, singing, <coughs> carrying flowers and balloons, happy as a pig could be. In the third frame, Goat says sarcastically, well, Rat, that's really working for you. <laughs> Rat's anger isn't going to subside and will likely <coughs> infect the rest of the community unless he gets to work it out with Pig. Jesus recognized that sin can break a relationship and fracture a community. He asked that the person who had been hurt initiate a conversation and work towards restoration with the other. Then if those two aren't listening, if they're not hearing each other, if they're not communicating well and working towards a resolution, then the conflict is taken before a small group so that the evidence is properly witnessed. And if the problem still can't be reconciled within that small group, it's taken before the whole community, before the church. <clears throat> and if the offender still refuses to listen, then he's to be treated as a Gentile or a tax collector. But we need to pause right there. Because in many incidences, that one line has been has led to people being shunned or banished from the community or excommunicated, which means prohibited from participating in communion. Stop for a moment and think if you could remember someone who's been forced out of the community because they have missed the mark. One of the main criticisms of the greater church is that it excludes, it pushes people away just at a time when they're in conflict and in confusion. When they have the greatest need, they're pushed out of the church. <coughs> Consider how the church has historically dealt with divorce. What happens if someone is charged with a crime? Not convicted of a child crime. What happens when someone's charged with a crime? The church starts to withdraw already. And in today's time, the church is arguing over how we interact with people as they come to grips with their own sexual orientation. Is this Jesus' way? Jesus is the author of this lesson. While tax collectors and Gentiles are outside of the Jewish community, we need to remember how Jesus responded to people on the margin. This passage immediately follows the parable of the shepherd who leaves his 96, 99 sheep to go in search of that one who's gone astray. This passage is immediately before the teaching of repeated forgiveness. And Jesus says, it's not good enough to forgive seven times, we have to forgive 77 times. A relationship has been broken. The offender's behavior <coughs> has caused him or her to become outside of the bounds of community. But Jesus spent his life inviting people into the community of God. This includes inviting, healing, restoring Gentiles and tax collectors. And we are called to follow that model of reconciliation. We're not alone. Jesus has promised that where two or three gather in his name, he will be there. Jesus will be there to guide us and to comfort us in our conflict. 
Jesus' presence will challenge us to work hard, to labor in love, and to endure certain people. Now, I have not yet witnessed among this congregation any personal interpersonal conflicts, but I have seen how this congregation deals with crisis. Last week, after Hurricane Irene, I asked people to check in with me. This is what I learned. In less than 12 hours, a third of you had let me know how you were doing. And I heard about people who had phoned the elderly homebound members of our congregation to make sure before the storm that they had the support needed to get through the storm. And I heard of families helping other families by pumping out flooded basements, by sharing transportation, by sharing meals. And within two days, the good men of our congregation, I believe it was Al and Bob, had cleaned up all the debris in our yard so that we could have family fun night. People came together in Christ to help others through their community. Where two or three were gathered, Jesus was working there. Oh, we're pretty good about caring for our other church members, but do we carry our Sunday lessons into the rest of the week? Some people compartmentalize their faith. They put Jesus back in the box Sunday after church. They're worried that if they carried their faith with them into their work, that into their place of work, that they might offend someone. How often do you think of your Sunday lessons when you're working through a conflict at home on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday? A great portion of our lives is spent working. Other than sleeping, there isn't any activity that we spend eight hours doing. Can we put Christ on, as the reading from Romans said, and take our Christian principles into work and school into all the corners of our lives? There is holiness in the ordinary and in the mundane when it is done in faith. Our work is pleasing to God. God has created each of us with unique gifts, and God is working through us and through our gifts for the good of the whole world. We are partners with God, fulfilling our baptismal promises to sustain and care for the world. What we do at work matters. Each week we gather to hear the word, but then we're sent back out in the world to live what we've learned. You confirm that at the end of every Sunday when you say, our worship is over, our service has just begun. <coughs> Although Labor Day was born amidst violence and conflict. Those days are behind us. Labor Day has become a day for parades and picnics and parties. It marks the end of the summer, and it marks the beginning of the NFL and college football season. This year in Baltimore, it ushers in the Grand Prix. But most importantly, it celebrates the social and economic achievements of American workers and their contributions to the strength, the prosperity, and the well-being of our nation. Our work matters when our lives are shaped by the cross. On this holiday, may you experience God's shalom as a blessing of your work. Amen.